Olain, and salutations to the Truth Corps, whoever and wherever you may be on the planet. I'm here again. <sighs> it's hard to escape from me these days. On what day? Beats me. I can't tell you what day it is. I'm, I might guess maybe the 25th of September. I know that the moon will be at its apogee at 9.41 this evening, universal time, meaning the moon at that moment will be at the point in its orbit most distance from the Earth. I know that, but I can only guess at what day it is. Anyway, what does it matter? It was a day, it's been a day, with a little drama. Now, I hate drama. I don't do drama. Maybe if it's life and death drama, then I would do that drama with humor and brutality. But on a day-to-day -day basis, in the ordinary affairs of human life, if indeed uh, anything ordinary ever happens in my life, I don't do drama. So it happens around me time to time. and It's actually the occasion for me talking to you today. You know, it does benefit me from time to time to just, to merely, not just. There is no justice, so there is no just. Uh, to merely talk to you for the purpose of unwinding a bit. And that's what I'm doing right now. So, today was one of those days when I found myself, for a few seconds, wondering if you wonder what the hell I do with myself and what I do with my time. If you don't wonder and you don't care, then don't listen. Simple. It's my pleasure to tell you what I'm doing with my time right now. And why is it a pleasure? Well, one of my standards in life is to only do what gives me pleasure or that which I find pleasure in. That's one of my standards. That's a standard of what I call in planetary tantra slang, uh, a tantrika. A tantrika is a voluptuary, a hedonist in the best sense of the word. Of course, it's true that hedonism due to the influence of the Albanians, has become something ugly and degenerate. But I'm not talking about that kind of hedonism. So I like to use the word hedonic rather than hedonistic. So I would say, yeah, hedonistic is bad news, but I'm not a hedonistic man. I'm hedonic. My character is hedonic. Pleasure is an extremely high value to me. Pleasure and beauty are my ultimate values. Along with truth, of course, if you can handle it. Hey, if I can handle it. So, in that context, in this vein, throughout this riff, I'd like to tell you about something I'm doing right now that I find pleasurable. I'm revisiting an old friend, a literary friend, a writer. Now, I've read a lot in my life since I was quite young, and I've written a lot. I wonder sometimes if you could tally up all the days or hours of my life what percentage that would be the time I put into 
reading and writing. I'd say it's a lot, and sometimes I wonder how I got anything else done. So literature, as you may have inferred from now, my friends, is a very big deal for yours, truthfully. Here's a little challenge. Name another popular guru or so-called spiritual teacher on the internet who can talk about literature. Can you think of one? So I love literature, but I'm also a terrible snob. And so I'm extremely selective about what I love and what I choose to read and those authors and writers that I choose to follow. I don't know if the audio is picking this up, but there's a dog barking in the background right now. And that's a cue or a clue to someone who is perhaps the writer that I admire the most in the entire world. How is the dog barking a cue to this individual? Well, he wrote many novels, I think 12 or 14, and his last novel was dedicated to the animals. He dedicated it to animals who can't read or write. Do you get that? He loved dogs, and there are some wonderful pictures of him with his dogs toward the end of his life when he lived just outside Paris. He was a most notorious man, and his name was Louis Ferdinand Céline. Where to begin? Well, how about when I first encountered Céline? Once again, I can be grateful to my braces for that. So I had two buck teeth, front teeth, when I was young, and my parents took me to get braces. And since we lived in this tiny little fishing village called Friendship Maine, we had to go far and wide to find an orthodontist who would do this. And I think between the age of 14 and 16, I wore braces and I loved it. I thought it was cool. I was the only kid in school who had braces. But in order to have these braces applied and to take care to go and tighten up the line to bring in the teeth from time to time, we had to drive up Route 1 to Bangor, Maine. And when we were there for the appointment, I would always run off and go to a bookstore because Bangor is near the University of Maine, where I eventually went for a short time. And there was a bookstore in the town that catered to the university students, so it had books in it relative to the courses that they had to take, you see, books that I would never have seen anywhere else in my life living in that small fishing village. And that's where I discovered Nietzsche, thus spake Zarathustra, and Journey to the End of the Night, Voyage au bout de la nuit by Céline. And those two books, more than any other books I read, in my mid-teens, completely transformed my life and set me on the direction to where I am today. Here's a little story about Voyage au bout de la nuit that will give you a glimpse of what kind of man Céline was. First of all, he was a doctor and his actual name was Louis Fernand de Touche, D-E-S-T-O-U-C-H-E-S. -E and when he became a writer in his 30s, he chose eventually not to publish under his own name. His mother was named Céline. It's a common first name for women in France. And he chose that name to replace his birth name. And when he was asked about that one time, he said, 
Well, you know, my mother was a lace maker. Now, lace making is a grueling task. Making lace by hand was a long, centuries long tradition in Europe, and it thrived in France and also in Belgium. Some of the most famous lace in the world has come from Belgium, from Brussels, where I also lived off and on for many years. So Celine said, the way I write is kind of like making lace. And so it's appropriate that I chose the name of my mother as my authorial name. Now, what happened with Journey to the End of the Night? Well, Celine was a doctor. He was trained as a physician. He was what you would call today a general practitioner. He grew up in one of the poorest areas of Paris in a wretched little alleyway. And all of his life, he was close to poor people, really poor people, the lowest of the low. And during his career as a general practitioner, which went in parallel with his writing career, he often helped poor people and he never charged them for what he did. So Céline was not known at all. He was a doctor, but he began to write and the first novel he wrote was Journey to the End of the Night. It's a long novel and it's in classical 19th century novelistic form. There's a great tradition among the French Zola, Stendhal, many others who wrote these novels, which were descriptive novels in a traditional genre. As to say, they weren't modernist novels. They were based on the 19th century model that was established by Stendhal and other people, Flaubert and so forth. So he wrote this straightforward novel to a semi-biographical. And when he finished it, he typed it all out and he got a piece of paper and he wrapped it up in a brown piece of paper and tied it with a string and took it to the office of some publisher and just left it in front of the door. And there was no name on the novel, neither his, his natural born name nor his assumed name. So the publisher, I forget who it was, read this book and they were completely blown away. They saw immediately that it was a product of enormous talent and, and literary genius of the highest level. And they didn't know what to do. But fortunately, the piece of brown paper in which he wrapped the novel was from a laundry. And apparently at that time, if you went to a laundry and you got shirts or trousers or something, they would give them to you and they'd wrap them up in something like brown wax paper. And it had the mark of the laundry on it. So they went to the laundry and in that way, they eventually found out who the author was. Those are two small stories in the life of Céline that might give you some idea of what kind of man he was. Céline was born in 1894 and he died in July 1961. Journey to the End of the Night in French came out in 1932. So he was 38 years old when this novel was written, which established him as what they call a literary giant, not only in the world of French language literature, but internationally. He's right at the top with the highest, most celebrated writers of the 20th century. So that book launched his career and what a career it was. But by the way, 
it's important to mention that it was not the first thing that he wrote, it was the first novel. In order to complete his training and become a general practitioner, he had to write a dissertation. And uh, so when he was, I think, uh, 28, he wrote this dissertation on the life and work of Ignaz Semmelweis. And he was a Swiss doctor who was known, among other things, for his discovery of the cause of purpural fever, which is something that afflicts women either during pregnancy or after birth. And so Semmelweis was admired by Céline and he wrote a dissertation on him in order to have his qualification as a doctor. But of course, that was not a novel. So what happened uh, next? What happened next? Yeah, well, Journey to the End of the Night came out in 1932. And anybody who knows anything about the history of the 20th century, who knows who that might be, given the condition of the world today, or even if you haven't read history, well, you know that something happened in the 1930s leading to something that happened in the 1940s. The rise of a certain regime in Europe, you could say. And of course, you cannot mention that event unless you speak of it with disgust and condemnation, right? But that event did happen, and the timing between Céline's career and the trajectory of that event is extremely close. In fact, his life and that event are intimately intertwined. About four years after Journey to the End of the Night came out, Céline, who was then known and celebrated and widely read, published his second novel. The title of that novel is Mort à Crédit, Death on Credit, uh, generally translated as Death on the Installment Plan. You get some idea from the title of Céline's mindset. And he did something in that novel, he started to do something which rocked the entire literary world and the entire literary tradition of France. Now, I don't know if you know any French who claim to be literate and sophisticated, but they are linguistic chauvinists and they take, that's a bad slur by the way, and they take great pride in the French language and in French literature. It has been certainly not anymore, hardly, but it has been a huge factor in their identity as the French people. So the French language is almost something sacred to them. And it's true, there have been many magnificent works written in the French language previous to Céline. So there's a deep foundation of a literary tradition in that country and among those people. Well, Céline, goddess bless him, blew that whole tradition right off its foundations. You see, Céline had enlisted in the army in World War I. In fact, the opening scene of Journey to the End of the Night describes how he did it, and it's hilarious. There's a lot of humor in Céline. Some people would say it's dark humor or gallows humor. But it does make you laugh. And in this First World War, in which he fought, as had been the case 
with the leader of the regime that came to power in Germany in the 30s, same war, he was wounded, shell-shocked, hit in the head by shrapnel, and he had to have a small metal plate installed in his skull, which he had all of his life. And biographers, I've read about three biographies of Céline, four maybe, biographers speculate that <laughs> Céline's head was not like an ordinary head. Not only was he a genius, but he was a wounded genius. And it's possible that, like Nietzsche, who suffered from terrible headaches, migraines, Céline also had something similar going. He never complained about it, but certainly his cranium and what was inside it were in a delicate condition. You know, Céline never drank alcohol throughout his entire life. And the only two things that Céline really loved, apart from his mission to be a writer, were dogs and dancers. Excuse me, not just dogs, all animals. But particularly at the end of his life, his closest companion was, were dogs. And as I said, he dedicated his last novel, Rigodon, to dogs, to the animals, not to people. He also loved cats. I'll get to that in a moment about his cat. So anyway, that's what he loved. He continued to look after people as a physician. He continued to write. And the pleasures of his life were animals and dancers. So he dedicated Journey to the End of the Night to an American dancer he met, Elizabeth Craig. And he met her when he traveled to the United States. And for the latter part of his life, I'd say the last 30 years, his closest companion was a dancer, Lucette. Lucette Amansor. He met her a couple of years after Journey came out. And they were together for the rest of their lives. And she survived him by a few years. You can see pictures of them together. Go check it out. So where was I? Yeah, about <laughs> about what Celine did with the novel. You see, as I said, Journey to the End of the Night is pretty classical in its form. But if you're ever in a bookstore and you see any other of the later novels by Celine, starting with Death on the Installment Plan, whether they're in French or English, if you riffle through them, something will immediately come to your attention, which is the ellipsis, or three dots. So normally when someone is writing a sentence or a novel or a paragraph, and they put three dots after a sentence, what does that signify? It signifies a, a lapse, a pause, or some kind of uncertainty. Well, all of Céline's novels written after Death on the Installment Plan are full of three dots. There is rarely a complete sentence in any one of them. Or if there are complete sentences in them, they're extremely brief. Now you might think that that would be unreadable. And I suppose to some people it is. But I have read Céline in his three dot novels, both in English and French. And I can tell you, it's not an easy haul. But if you do read it, if you do get on to what he's doing, if you do get on to 
that style and the intention of the style, it is totally breathtaking. Celine himself explained it in this way. It went back to his experiences on the front in World War I, to being shell-shocked, to being diving, to diving, climbing out of trenches and diving into holes in the mud, being surrounded by gunfire and explosives. And he said that he wanted to write in a way that repeated the, the sensation of that experience because as far as he was concerned with World War I, the whole world, especially the Western world, was thrown into a state of shock like a soldier on the front lines as he had been. And he wanted to convey shock and disorder and confusion in his novels. And he managed to do that. And yet the novels are coherent stories. They do tell stories. They have plots. He was really a master lace maker. To be able, imagine what that was, to be able to write sentences that end paragraph after paragraph, page after page in three dots and end up telling a coherent and meaningful story with a tremendous moral impact. And that is Celine's achievement. No one else has come close to anything like this. Another aspect of that style concerns the subject of hallucinations. Now there's a wonderful pun in French on the word Celine which goes like this. The French word for hallucination is hallucination. And the pun is hallucination. It relates to the expression in French, the slang, c'est hallucinant, that's hallucinating. It means that's something wild, really wild and out of the ordinary. And in a way, these novels, written with a three-point style, were literary hallucinations, but they were lucid hallucinations. And all of Celine's writing had that single purpose, to show by his style and his stories that all of humanity was in a condition of hallucinating shock. And one of the dangers of being in this condition, there are many of course, was that the very sense of humanity would be lost, as would occur, as you can imagine, if you were on the front lines in World War I, one of the most and first worldwide insane and inhumane events in history. So that's where Celine was coming from, you see. Another time when he was asked about this bizarre style in which he wrote, he said, well, I'm just trying to describe what I experienced. And he said, how did he put it? He said, look at this passage, and he cited this passage in one of his later books, which occurs in a situation where one of the cities in France was being bombed, okay? And he said, imagine what happens to the furniture. And he had seen this firsthand. He described sitting in an apartment on the terrace and looking out at the other houses around in the square when the bombs hit them and all the furniture came flying out. And he said, imagine a chest of drawers, right? projected out of a house by a bomb, spinning in the air, and the drawers are being thrown open by the spin, and all of the clothes are coming out. That's how I write. I could talk about Celine for days. I truly love Celine. But not to go on too long, 
with my rant, I'll bring it around to the really, really controversial part of the story. So during the 1930s, when certain things of world shaping significance were unfolding in Europe, Céline wrote a series of books which have become notorious in French literature and indeed worldwide. Between 36 and 38, he wrote three books. The first one was called Mea Culpa, which means my fault. The second one was called Bagatelle pour un massacre, which means trifles for a massacre. And trifle means, of course, a little tidbit that you eat like little cakes or little desserts. So imagine that you're sitting somewhere in front of a large square in Europe. You have an apartment on the square and you're sitting on the balcony and you have in front of you a plate of trifles and you watch what's happening in the square. And what's happening is a genocide and a massacre of an unbelievable scale. So that book was the second in this series, and the third one is called L'Ecole des Cadavres, which means the School for Cadavers. And these three books are not considered to be books. They're not novels. They're more you could say they're diatribes, they're eruptions of tremendous rage. And they have become known from the time they were written as pamphlets or pamphlets, or they also call them feuilleton, which just means some kind of trash novel. And they have been condemned from the time they were written. So somebody published them, I forget who it was, and almost immediately they were suppressed and copies were collected and they were burned. And when I discovered Céline at the age of 16, in the uh, early 1960s, no one ever talked about these. If you read anything about Céline, they would just say, oh, those horrible pamphlets, um, they're unavailable, even in French. And actually, strange as it may be, a couple of years ago, when I was in Belgium, I happened to catch the French news, and uh, I saw that, I think it was Gaimard, or some prominent French publisher had decided to re-release these pamphlets. And there was a huge stinko controversy about this. Why would they do this? Because this was something deplorable that Céline had done. And people who admired Céline were wringing their hands and lamenting, how could such a great man, in certain ways, so humane and so profound in his view of the human condition, allow himself to write these horrible pamphlets? Why were they horrible? Well, I'll leave that to your imagination for the moment. No, I won't. I'll tell you exactly why, and you can see it coming, right? In these books, written in the mid-30s, Céline came out with all guns blazing against what he considered to be a deplorable, evil development in human affairs, and of course, I'm talking about the Albanians, right? Or to be more precise, Céline 
exposed and objected in no pleasant terms to the chewification of Western civilization. And for that, he has been condemned and is still condemned largely to this day. So what I've been doing lately, when I allow myself the leisure time to read, is I've been reading one of these pamphlets. Only one, well, two have been translated into English, but only one has been published. Trifles for a Massacre. Which is hilarious. And I cannot even begin to describe the language that he uses the brutal humor and the black humor and the lucid insight that he has about this problem in the world, this unique problem. Can I describe what it's like to read Céline's pamphlet? It's a kind of elixir, but not for everyone to imbibe. Some years ago, when I was doing the Gaia navigation experiment between 2011 and 2014, I came across a quote by Céline. I can't quote it directly. I think it was from an interview. And I put it out at that time to the group of students and friends who were following that event with me. In this quote, Céline says, and he probably said this around 1935-36 when he was writing these diatribes, these documents of his outrage. He said, if we don't watch out, we meaning white Western European people, if we don't take a good look at the course we're on and where it's going, then there's a big chance that the white races will be exterminated. Céline said that 80, 85 years ago. That was that realization of that risk, that threat was in the forefront of his mind. So as I said, I could talk, and it's my, a pleasure, it's my pleasure to talk about Céline with you. But I'll conclude with just another story. Now Céline loved dancers, and he also liked twins. I can stand with him on that one. And he loved cats, particularly one cat, Bebe. Now this cat, Bebe, is the most famous cat in French literature. To my knowledge, he's the only cat that actually had a book written about him. <laughs> yes, that's true. Someone wrote a biography of Bebe. So, the story goes that at a certain point, Céline and Lucette fled. Now, where do you think they went when they fled France? Well, they went to their neighbors in Germany. Yes, indeed they did. And Céline wrote one or perhaps more novels in the three dot style about his life in Germany. One of them is called D'un Château L'Autre, which is translated as Castle to Castle, because for a while he actually lived in a castle in Germany in association with certain other individuals who are too evil and dangerous to even mention, right? So, after the war, naturally, obviously, Céline was 
accused of being a collaborateur. He collaborated with the enemy. He did that. So picture now Germany in 1945 at the end of the war. Now it is a very great fact that most of the pictures that you have ever seen of the destruction in Europe in World War II are pictures of towns and cities in Germany. Even when the war was over, even when it was obvious that the Allies had won, they continued to bomb Germany and they firebombed over 60 German cities and towns. I think there were something like 12 or 16 of them which were reduced to such rubble that there was nothing left but bricks and dust. They also caused enormous death to civilians. These cities that they bombed, firebombed like Dresden in February of 1945. Hamburg and other cities were not military targets. They just bombed the hell out of the German population. There's a film about that. It's called Hellstorm. Go look into it if you can take it. And so imagine that scene at the end of the war. And what was Celine doing? That man. Well, he was in Berlin and he decided to go to Denmark because that's where Lucette was. So how did he get from Berlin to Denmark? He walked. And as he walked in his bomber jacket, his leather bomber jacket, he kept Bebe with him. So Louis Fernand Céline walked through Germany in that scene of absolute and utter hell with his beloved cat. And they both arrived alive in Copenhagen. Such are the things that you need to know if you're going to talk about the man, Céline. Enough said, and I'll be seeing you in the beauty to come.